the sounds of constant sirens. Sidewalks full of blood, vomit, and urine are predominant on Winnipeg's main street. The people are unpredictable, fueled by desperation and loneliness. Many of them are critically mentally ill with nowhere to go. Every person on the street is there for different reasons. I am a survivor. Each of these people were once someone's child, and depending on their circumstances, are left without much hope or help. Life goes on, you know. Life goes on. Life goes on, no matter where you are. Most of these people have no support system except their fellow street people. I was a person that was in the shelters and they give up on us. But you know what? You can make it even though you try your best, try your best. It feels like there are fuses on each and every one of them. And no one can predict the length of the fuse. I do have a hard time living in my life because nobody ever taught me how to live a life. They don't even know what they give us in our paradise. And now look what I have. This is all I got. There is a prevailing sense of hopelessness. And unfortunately, that outlook becomes contagious. They're just waiting for us to die. Maybe. But I live my life and I'm trying my best to live the best as I could. And it's hard, it's hard. Drugs, alcohol, and solvents are everywhere. North End Shooter? Yeah. Hand sanitizer, that's two bucks. And you got 25 ounces, so at the liquor store you get a bottle of liquor, it's $25. It is not a safe place. The revolving doors of the justice system see people released into the same environment with the same associates that inevitably send them right back to jail. Everybody's dropped off in one area, so that from, from a government perspective it's containment. But from a human standpoint, nobody can get out of the cycle. Individuals who are out there on the street are not vagrants. They are homeless individuals, plain and simple. Available to them all are five main shelters. Salvation Army houses 600 people and has three levels of housing, from mats on a floor to small dormitories to individual rooms. Salome Mission has open dormitories for nightly shelter. In the daytime, residents are released to the streets and they must return by 8 p.m. to assure a spot for nighttime rest. Main Street Project is the lowest of the low, mainly for solvent abuse and chronic alcoholics who are unable to abide by any rules and there are mats on the floor at night. The Bell Hotel has individual rooms. The criteria for being housed here is that you've been homeless for 90 days. It is a wet facility. Alcohol and solvents are allowed, more for harm reduction than prevention. In the middle of this bleak landscape, there is an alternative. Red Road Lodge is a single occupancy dry facility. It is the only homeless shelter that has organized activities for the residents, including art, music, woodworking, gardening, cooking, beadwork, and more. It houses 45 people who are allowed pets. She's a grouchy little kitty cat. <laughs> I put in that. What did you do today, put in that? How did you eat and sleep? The Red Road in Aboriginal teachings was this road to, we might call it heaven, someone else might call it nirvana. It's the road we want everybody to be on, that you take control of your life. To us, it, it really is what our mission is. You gonna have something to eat? There's, there's lots there to eat. You help yourself, you know it's quality made. Richard Walls is CEO and founder of Red Road Lodge, an urban visionary for downtown Winnipeg. His philosophies are ahead of his time. With his background as a commercial designer specializing in the hotel and bar industry, he always had a keen interest in the artistic districts in every city he visited and eventually cast his eye around his own city. It really became uh, apparent to me that Main Street was suffering and because I'd been involved in urban renewal things like the Exchange District, I thought what a great opportunity. Uh, real estate's cheap. Uh, I could come into Main Street and create an artist village. Richard's first move was buying the old Norman Meats building on Main Street and converting it into artist lofts. Then he looked around at other opportunities. One of the worst places in the neighborhood was the Occidental Hotel, which had had a reputation for 
well over 100 years as being one of the toughest, roughest bars in the city. And it came up for sale. So I somewhat naively said, I'm going to buy it, thinking that if you just managed the hotel better, you could turn the bar around, it could become kind of a blues bar. You know, the people that lived here were kind of okay, they were just poor. And one of the things I noticed very early in getting involved in Main Street was that people that are homeless or virtually homeless, the beverage room became their living room. You would walk into the beverage room, people would be sitting in a corner with a paper bag, sniffing solvents or drinking a beer. Uh, it was just, uh, just a, a cesspool of, of people that were sort of slowly killing themselves. So I made a decision that the best thing for the neighborhood was to get rid of the liquor license, get rid of the VLTs, and just run this as a housing facility. Everybody needs a safe home. That's the number one thing is you need a safe home, but you also need positive people around you. Good to see ya. Being a dry facility and a home for recovery, we expect that individuals who come through the door are ready to work on recovery from whatever their past is. Beverly Roberts is the Red Road Lodge manager and house mother. Okay, well why don't you meet her here with me and we'll organize it. Okay. 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 She is a fighter. She believes we as a society are letting these people down and asking too much of them. But she is also hard on the residents when she needs to be, and she calls them to task to take care of themselves. I just walked in the door. People have been helping you all day, and you need to be patient. She maintains a sober environment as best as she can. You know, like a family, you sort of have your moments where you get along and your moments where you don't get along, but underneath there's this underlying uh, care for each other. Gabby likes noisy people. Gabby Desjardins is Red Road Lodge case manager and Bev's right-hand gal. I've never had a connection with a manager like I do with Bev. We struggle with structure around here. You know, we try and plan things, but there's always some sort of crisis going on. She totally accepts the craziness and, and just goes with the flow with me. The politicians, I think, supported the idea from day one, but the administration was saddled with the challenge of where do we fit in this funding housing paradigm. If they're going to give us some money, something else has to get cut. So we struggled and struggled and struggled, but eventually uh, made some inroads with the government. And we got some funding as an urban art center, which allowed us to take our main floor and engage some artists to work with people that are at the lodge. And those artists, I mean, the art could be arts and crafts. It could be musical, could be clay, could be painting, could be building birdhouses. Uh, it was a variety of things, but it got people engaged in, in alternate activities uh, and allowed us to, uh, you know, develop life skills. Yeah, you can get... What is really happening is, like, they're learning how to be okay. Just on a, on a very first step level, everybody seems to just think that, like, oh, well, they're just, you know, dirty alcoholics and, you know, I don't have to listen to them and let's keep the car moving super fast through this area because they don't deserve to have even me look at them. And it's like, well, you know, Holy smokes, I hope you never find yourself in that position. We see the people driving down Main Street, rolling up their windows, not wanting to look a homeless person in the face because they're afraid they're gonna get robbed. Not every homeless person fits these narrow stereotypes. Lance Pless served our country in the military. Yeah, that's me shooting a machine gun. And is plagued with post-traumatic stress disorder. He is currently trying to put his life back together. Part of the reason for my PTSD is from my military service, but most of it is from my in integration into society. That's something that, that I'm just now, after 18 years, learning to deal with. The communal nature of the art studio has helped Lance and others to come out of their shell and connect with each other. As the main floor of the hotel became more of a community resource center and just not a drop-in center, um, the arts uh, component really became a, a big part of people's lives. For a period of time, we were opening our art studio to people off the street. As long as you were appeared to be straight and sober, you could come in and get involved in arts activities. I came in here, but I didn't really know the studio was here until they started um, 
inviting me and I seen all this stuff here hey what's going on all this paint and all that it's real and it's just like that's what kind of got me to the mood to start doing my art again we've had a lot of good people particularly from the arts community contribute to what we're doing at the Red Road Lodge in the Red Road Lodge, I work at the front desk. I, I, a lot of times I volunteer cooking, and sometimes I work in the studio on Friday. I can't talk with my mouth full. Pat Bradour practices an art form called birch bark biting and is a positive force and inspiration around the lodge. Birch bark biting is one of the oldest uh, First Nations art forms, and it was done before contact. They're still finding them in archaeological digs today. Um, and they were done all the way from Labrador to the west coast of Canada. They were done to record our stories and our ceremonies. <laughs> and um, Obviously, this touches something deep, and one can see how meaningful the art making is for these people. It was almost a lost art form, so about 20 years ago I started doing it and I teach about sometimes 3,000 kids a year. And one of the main reasons why I started doing it was because I didn't want it to be a lost art form. Kevin Anderson is dying from a rare form of cancer. He was injured on the streets one night and woke up in the hospital to find out he was really sick. He has since tried to turn his life around. Art is his healing. It's helped him with his fight against addiction. In order to forget stuff, I would make, um, get into drugs and alcohol. It would just take me away. So it would, it would like uh, dull the feeling of everything that's happened. But uh, I found a tool to help me out here. So yeah. Kevin has even drawn a comic book about his cancer, creatively working with his bleak situation. Uh, I find them to be the bravest and the most courageous and the most honest people I know. It's inspiring to live and work with them. We were really looking for individuals who want to be part of a community of people. Hi. I think we offer a really unique model that allows people to make their individual space home, whatever that means to them. It is what it is. We have one fellow here as a dog, a tarantula, a scorpion, and a bearded dragon. Definitely nobody can make you change. Um, like I said, I, I've gone through the years of, you know, getting arrested, doing all the stupid stuff, being forced into stuff. Uh, you have to want to do it. You know, if you really think you want to change, put it into recovery, you know, give it that chance. You know, it all takes time. We definitely didn't become addicts in one day. And it's a lifelong disease. Like, I'm never not going to be an addict. I don't understand wanting to do just one of anything. Uh, I still can't comprehend that today. It makes no sense to me. You know, I can turn anything into addiction. If you don't have positive supports in your life, it's easy to slip or relapse. Don't exhaust yourself. If you need help with anything, Ask. boys will help you tomorrow. Okay. Okay? Sounds good. Adios, amigos. Social integration is one of the most important aspects that when someone comes in here, you're actually signing up for a variety of activities. You're not just getting a room. I like the model. I like the idea of a small room. You got your privacy, you've got the ability to, you know, read, watch TV, but you're mandated to come downstairs, help out in the kitchen, help out with some of the janitorial tasks, help out in the carpentry shop. I got a lot done in the room last night. Oh good. Or well, we yesterday. The toilet area is all done. It's not a, a workplace in the normal sense. You know, you put in your volunteer hours, you contribute to the place that you're living. You're all part of a big family. When you're 53 and ancient like him, <laughs> your body tells you, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> you're gonna make me work too hard, Lord. <laughs> Larry and Lloyd are definitely a team, and the two of them are a clear sign of a growing optimism. We work with the Downtown Biz and Red Road Lodge clean team and we pick up the garbage that a lot of people discard on the street. We also help if we see any person that uh, needs any help or is distraught for any medical assistance and it's almost like two or three times a week this happens. You work along your own recovery path. For some people, 
That's just learning how to live independently. If you're addicted, it's someplace safe to come. Get away from the negative influences. I used to cut because of my depression. I have scars all over my body. People used to say, why don't you hide them? Why hide them? They show who I am and what I've overcome. Overcoming is the key word. This is especially evidenced in the case of Kevin and Pat with their art activities, which have been recently exhibited publicly. They are both becoming visible signs in the community that recovery is possible and that something special is happening at Red Road Lodge. They have both just graduated from Aboriginal Business School for their art. The pride in themselves and that others feel for them is really something. Where we are today with the Red Road Lodge, we've, we've gone from what the government called um, emergency housing to what we call um, transitional housing, with the end goal being that they would transition on to independent living somewhere else in the community. Pat is currently moving on to better things. Okay. okay. Pat moved out this past week. She's got a house. And so her and her daughters have a real home. And March 1st would be the one year anniversary of her walking through the doors of the lodge. And she said to me, I don't know where we would be if it hadn't been for the lodge. Bye, Pat. Bye. <laughs> this place provides um, clean as a, an addict. It helped me a lot until after a while I started getting restless. I needed my own kitchen, you know, stuff like that, even though I had a bathroom. and But then processed food, it doesn't really appeal to you and you don't have a kitchen. Because the population of Red Road Lodge is constantly in flux, it is crucial to treat this ongoing change as new opportunity. We know how many folks are out there who equally need our help. And then it becomes this whole process of who else can we take and do we have the right funding and do we have the right staff. Basically, the effort to secure funding is just as chaotic and transitory as the turnover of people at the lodge. We were successful in applying for funding, program funding that would last a year, but basically you don't get no stability in your workforce. And Bev took on the challenge as a one-person show, dealing with the individuals one-on-one -on -one because she has a big heart. Um, and also trying to move the organization forward, dealing with the various levels of government. This year, federal funding was cut. This was a major blow which threatened the very existence of the art studio, if not the lodge itself. I'm never caught up with the work that has to be done. Right now, sitting here, I have about $60,000 in documents that I have to file in order to recoup that money from grants. And I also have another high-level document for HPS I want to put in place, which is $250,000 I'm going for. And then, of course, I've got my funding from the provincial government that I'm currently trying to put in place. I'm just going to stick this in the scanner here. As Bev puts together another proposal for renewed federal funding, she is forced to scramble and cobble together money from wherever she can to keep the lodge running for the short term. She has to keep the vision alive against all odds. We have $6,000 in workshop fees, and we are launching a counselor, a bona fide registered counselor who's going to start her next week and she will be able to bring counseling for individuals to the lodge and she will be able to also bring a horticulture therapy component and she will also bring a mindfulness stress reduction based therapy that is known worldwide and will be leading edge because the other SROs, the other organizations, the other institutions, the other facilities offering housing, they don't have this. It is this funding to provide for on-site professional help that is most desperately needed. But in the meantime, at least there are great volunteers and staff currently working. Pete. Thelma is a former Red Road Lodge tenant who is now an employee with a heart of gold. Pete. This area, you see so many homeless people, so many people with addictions. You know, if my heart could go out to those people and help them, I would. What about Robert St. Mars? Oh. No, I can't. He was too good of a friend. Very. Thelma has just been asked to speak about Robert, a former Red Road Lodge resident who has recently committed suicide. Sorry. We were very close as friends. When I called Richard and told him that Robert St. Mars had died, he was 
so shaken. And he said, you know, it's something that we need to tell everybody who's here that you don't know how fragile that person is. You just don't. So when you walk through, you have to take the time. When you're running a facility like this, you've got you know, 45 problems times everything else that goes into a business. <coughs> so unfortunately, losing our HPS funding, I would say, would be one of the things that contributed to Robert's demise. That had we got that HPS funding, we would have had a staff person in the studio that could have maybe spent some time with him. Um, but that didn't happen. Another major fallout from losing the federal funding is that without staffing, non-residents are now prevented from coming in off the streets during the day to use the studio. I see so many people that used to come to the studio when it was open, and now I look at them and they've fallen so far. Because the studio is no longer open. They can't come here to stabilize themselves, to help themselves. They don't know what else to do. Although the studio remains open as a resource to residents, the lack of adequate funding for hiring trained mental health personnel to supervise activities leads to blind spots for staff. Unfortunately, one of the things we don't get here is a medical diagnosis from a psychiatrist. We don't know what's wrong with the people. We just sort of guess. As it stands now, volatilities often erupt without warning. I was assaulted by a resident yesterday. He dove across the front desk and punched me in the face. I was totally shocked. We have rules because all homes need to have rules about behavior, about consideration, and about how you treat each other. And so one of the sort of defining lines for me when I deal with individuals and their recovery and their behavior is when they cross the line that affects negatively other residents or puts other residents at risk, they're done. This dividing line may seem harsh, but it is important for what the Lodge is trying to achieve. Because the people are here in recovery, we can't have the person next door, you know, using or dealing or, you know, coming in drunk because it, it drags down the other 45 people that live here. The bigger problem is what happens to those who are too volatile to be housed. Take, for instance, David Sanderson. Abused as a child, David has been a solvent abuser since he was six years old. Okay. I'll get you more. He is now one of the province's highest risk offenders and spends his time on the streets and jail. David sort of is on the periphery. He has no place to live because he can't be housed because of his criminal past and his solvent use and his violence. There's someone who has been banned from Salome Mission, Main Street Project, UGM, the Lighthouse. Wherever there's food, wherever there's clothing, he can't go. So he has no home, no food, no community support. Is he going to be able to use that sleeping bag? I can use it. What happens if you don't have a sleeping bag? I can use it. But this sweater, I'll take the sweater. It's, 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 it's nice and warm. I, I like it. It's nice and warm. The judges keep releasing David back onto our streets with no treatment plan, all the while understanding that he is high risk to society and to himself. I don't, I don't want to bother anybody because people are scared, eh? They're scared of you? Yes, they don't know me. Is that how you keep warm? Yeah. David has to keep moving on cold nights in order to keep from falling asleep and risk freezing to death. It seems like the difficulties never end. Individuals who have so little, be it mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially, are expected by the parameters set out by legislation and policy to fit inside a box. And the box essentially is Monday to Friday from 8.30 to 4.30 when social services are available. So please, if you're not well, be not well in that time. Because after 4.30, if you have crisis, you have EMS, ambulance, police, and that's about it. And the police aren't trained to deal with this, and nor should we put a drain on society by using police services to care for people in crisis that's related to mental illness or trauma. When they close down uh, mental institutions, which is probably a good idea, uh, people just ended up on the street. And that's one of the reasons that we have the malls downtown, um, Main Street are full of people wandering around because there's no place for them to go. There's, they just said, okay, fend for yourself. And this is the major problem. Winnipeg streets are littered with lost souls. 
and many are solvent abuse cases such as David's. It's a difficult thing to witness. Wandering in a daze, with a rag held up to the mouth, they breathe in the fumes of whatever solvent they can get their hands on. It's a very inexpensive way for them to escape the reality that they are forced into. They have lost all hope. Did you sleep last night? <laughs> sleep at all? <laughs> sleep at all, yeah. yeah. We can't deal with people that have SNP addictions. That's a whole level that's still missing uh, in the sort of system of where do you house these people. It's probably one of the most important ones that needs to be addressed. We, we need people that are, are above that because we don't have the training. You've got to be into a, into a special care facility to wean them off that over a long term. And mentally, generally, most of them have already damaged their brain quite severely. So we're not the right place for them. He needs a treatment center to deal with his addiction. We don't have a treatment center for solvent use. When you talk about the have-nots, they're the have-nothings. They have nobody who cares. And guess what? They have no hope because there's no treatment and there's no answer right now unless we actually make them a priority and make the system fit their needs instead of them fit the system. And so that is the big question. How do they fit in the system? Certainly not in jail. And yet, this is where David has now landed, yet again. Hi. He doesn't have to do much for them to actually breach him and put him in jail. If it was a first-time offender, they would probably not even respond to it. With someone with his history, they do. His probation officer is always really distressed because his lawyer feels she's doing her job when she gets him out of jail. But she doesn't actually care when she gets him out of jail that he has no home. The last time David was out, he called me, and he had no place to sleep. He had only the clothes on his back. So he came, we made him dinner, I sat out in the garden with him, I fed him, he cried. I came in, I got him more food, I packed it for him. He didn't have a coat, he didn't have a blanket, and I sent him on his way. He came back the next day, I'd been to Salome, and got him more clothing and told him to come and have a shower. And when he went up to the shower room, Cornelius came downstairs and said he could hear David crying because he has nothing and then you give him something. Although Red Road is unable to accept David for housing, Bev has asked David to write a letter in jail telling his story and his needs so that upon his release, they can present it to the government. Let's go for a walk. You can tell me what else you need. Yeah. When was the last time you had a good dinner? The goal in all of this is to present the government with a human face connected to these huge issues. I don't want them judging you for being in and out of jail all the time. I want them to understand what the trouble is that you encounter on the street and how difficult it is for you to manage out there. So I'm trying to make you a real person with real problems so they're not judging you inappropriately. Hopefully David's personal letter will make his voice real to government officials. I started using solvents when I was six years old and now I'm 39. I had a big problem about life. I wasn't brought up and in a very nice home, and the family were very abusive. Sometimes I would break the law just to have a place to sleep and stay warm when winter comes. My workers are having a hard time finding housing because of solvents and the problem I'm dealing with. I feel the spirit working through my broken life. It's like a missing link. You want something good to happen, and it doesn't happen. I need help. Solvent abuse is one of the most complicated addictions to help an individual find recovery. The brain damage that can happen is severe. Traditional models that have worked with alcohol don't work with solvent abuse. And so it is pushing the system to try and look at different ways. Upstairs, the Provincial Minister for Housing has agreed to discuss the issues and hear the plea for some sort of change. Lance also gets an opportunity to voice his concerns. I was an officer. In, in the Canadian military, and uh, I broke at the Salvation Army. I, I thought I was going to go crazy, and a lot of people do, because we're all lumped in. It's criminals, people with severe mental mm -hmm. handicaps. I always tell people we have to have patience. I had a, a mentor who talked about making change in government is like, you know, turning the Titanic. Like, it takes effort, and it takes commitment, and it takes passion not just from the officials that represent the department, 
but also from community citizens as well. One can only be hopeful for the efforts of David and Lance today. Perhaps something will come of it. Time will tell. to identify this group of really special people that are living lives outside the rest of the world, being judged inappropriately. So in a perfect world, society would start to see the circumstances that have taken this infant to where they are and stop judging the adult they see in front of them. I think that would be a really great place to start. <laughs> I really sincerely believe that a family is a circle of friends who love you. So. We are a circle of friends who care about each other. Some people on the third floor coming down. Eat more! Food is excellent. Somehow the housing authorities have got a real disconnect in terms of what people really need. And our goal is housing is not the answer, it's homes, and that's what we're building at the Red Road Lodge. Has a girlfriend, Eric has a girlfriend. <laughs> you know, we just get into shenanigans because we are the shabby chateau and we specialize. And it just juggles from there. And it's crisis management and it's bad behavior management and it's scolding and admonishment and it's hugs and it's celebrations <laughs> and accolades and trying to every day find the way to move things forward. Currently, the federal funding is not up for any kind of review. The province has given the Lodge a first-time operating grant, which will expire at the end of the year. There are no other funds available at this time. With the future of the Lodge, nothing is certain. Everything hangs in the balance, on a hope and a prayer. ta, -ta. Right on, my girl. <laughs>